Okay, hello. Now we're into lecture nine. This is on antimicrobial medications. Now, just to clarify something, keep in mind this is not just going to merely be limited to the antibiotics, drugs that are used to treat bacterial infections, but we are going to expand upon that for viruses and fungi and other organisms as well. You have to keep in mind that we have a variety of products which act to inhibit or destroy pathogens. Some only work topically, and we'll explain why. Others system systemically. Also, the usefulness of these compounds may be endangered. Basically, everybody is familiar, one way or another, with antibiotic resistance. Now, many compounds will act on killing the pathogens by blocking a metabolic or reproductive process or by actively damaging the cellular structure of the organism. So that's part of a theme you're going to see as we go through this. There are some offshoots of that <clears throat> as we move forward. First off, of course, when you move forward, you see here we have a person that's doing a lot of antimicrobial work. You notice from the bottom upward, she's looking at a bunch of plates. Notice that she's got a bunch of the plates with active organisms, sort of a bacterial lawn, and you can see a lot of Kirby Bauer discs being used. This is presumably for antibiotic tests. And uh, I thought this was a good way to give you a view of things. This person is doing antibiotic susceptibility testing. Now, before we get into all the things about it, we have to be really understanding the terms. An antimicrobial, otherwise known as an antimicrobial drug, is a drug used to treat microbial infections. A chemotherapeutic agent is any agent, any chemical that's used to treat a disease. An antibacterial drug is a drug, a chemical, used to treat a bacterial infection, whereas an antifungal drug is a chemical used to treat a fungal infection. An antiviral drug is used to treat a viral infection. And this kind of makes itself somewhat obvious. Antiprotozoal drug, some chemical used to treat a protozoal infection. Antihelmetic drug, some chemical used to treat helmetic infection. But where does the history really go? Everybody would immediately pop up and say, well, Fleming, but before Fleming was Paul Ehrlich. <clears throat> now, Ehrlich, in 1910, developed the first chemical treatment for Trypanina palatum, otherwise known as syphilis. It was an arsenic compound called salvarisan. It's actually also called, when he first called it, he called it compound 606 because it was the 606 drug out of a variety of tests that he had used that clearly eradicated the uh, syphilis spirochetes. Now, if you ever get an opportunity to read, um, and I always am an advocate of students reading, read about his life and the back, the pushback that he experienced because he had come to treat a, a disease that was basically debilitating, uh, many cases sexually transmitted, but could be transmitted in utero, could be transmitted uh, by blood transfusion, but they didn't have them there. But the sad thing is the person's debilitated and were relegated off to an uh, insane asylum. And yet he, cr he created the drug to treat it, and there were many people that objected it. Some, I should say. Now, Alexander Fleming in 1928 discovered the penicillin fungus used to treat that created chemicals, and, and uh, the chemicals were penicillin, to treat bacteria. And this bacteria was a staphylococcus. As a matter of fact, if you go to <clears throat> the uh, English, I believe it was the British University that he was working at, they still have sort of a dried uh, Petri dish that contains the original culture, okay? It's just incredible to think about that. Gerhard Dormach in 1932 used a red dye called protosil to treat uh, streptococcus infections. Later found that the drug was converted by the animal enzymes to sulfanilamide, and that is basically involved with uh, blocking the foliate enzyme uh, process to make DNA. René Dubois in 1939 was the American microbiologist that isolated the first substance Okay, tyrothricin. This is made by the soil microbe Bacillus brevis and later showed that it was composed of really two substances, gramma, uh, gramocidin and uh, tyrosidine. 
And these were the first antibiotics to actually be manufactured commercially. Now, Ernest Chain and Howard Fleury, <clears throat> with the onset of World War II, a lot of medical personnel, public health, doctors, surgeons, military surgeons were really, really uh, concerned about uh, another world war that would lead to many, many individuals maimed. Because, you know, if you had an infection in the leg, the only way to treat it was basically cut off the leg. So they began this process also with several others, including, I believe, one of the uh, initial starters of the Merck pharmaceutical firm. And they developed the process to mass produce and then purify penicillin. Now, Selman Waxman, in 1943, isolated and developed streptomycin from the soil bacteria, Streptomyces griseus. And by the way, to this day, we still have researchers that are going up and looking at various soil bacterium and how they secrete certain products for potential new antibiotics. Now, if you take a look at the, anti, the penicillin family tree, just this one alone, there's several different penicillins that were first isolated. They were each identified by the letter, um, you know, penicillin G, penicillin B, etc. Now, <clears throat> subsequent research on mutated strains, and this is where we get into what I mentioned earlier about mutations. They induced mutations via chemicals or x-rays, as well as chemically altering the penicillin structure yielded more productive strains and new versions of penicillin. Different penicillin compounds usually have the 6-APA that's the amino pentacilic acid uh, structure in common. Nope, not there yet. Sorry about that. We'll see this in a little bit. Now, methicillin is a penicillin family member that is resistant to inactivating enzymes from bacteria. Methicillin, though, is used to treat bacteria resistant to penicillin. And that was going okay until MRSA. Methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus. These strains arrived, and the treatment of choice then moved up to vancomycin. And I can tell you by the turn of the 20th, 21st century, they started having Versa, vancomycin resistant Staphylococcus aureus. And we still have new revelations of uh, bacteria strains that are developing resistance. Now, the term semi synthetic is chemically modified compounds. And you see some of those later on as we move into the 70s and 80s. Okay, now, antimicrobial drugs. When we look at the modern antibiotics, they are obtained from soil organisms like Streptomyces and Bacillus, as well as fungal organisms like Penicillin and Cephalosporum. New research has spurned, you know, has spurred, been spurred due to the rise of bacterial organisms with resistance to various drugs. To help you understand this, there was a point where a lot of pharmaceutical firms stopped actual antibiotic research. And in the 70s, everybody sat on their, their laurels, literally, and said, we got enough, excuse me, enough antibiotics. Let's start looking at, you know, cancer cures and heart disease cures and cures for psoriasis and everything else. And in some cases, the antibiotic development uh, departments languished or were shut down totally. By the time the 1990s, with the onsets of new resistant strains of pathogens, they started getting revved up. So for a while, people would sit there and go, well, you're looking into antibiotic research. Forget it, kid. You don't got a future. Blah, 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 blah. Wait a, dec wait a decade. Wait two decades. And boom, they all come back and say, could you please come to our lab and run our laboratory for developing new antibiotic strains? And that's still going on today. But there is something you need to know about uh, antibiotics or all antimicrobial compounds. There are terminologies that have to be used here, and some of them are involving such issues as toxicity, terms of action, spectrum of action, distribution, excretion, metabolism, etc. So let's talk about that. When I say there is a selective toxicity, these are drugs that exhibit greater toxicity to the pathogens than to the human organism. Now, if you look at humans and you look at a bacteria, there's big differences in structure of cell, big differences in the genome, big differences in even just the ribosomes. So here's a point to keep in the back of your mind. The closer you are uh, genetically, biochemically to a human being, the harder it is going to be to develop treatments against pathogens.
If that pathogen is eukaryotic, if that pathogen is multicellular, if that pathogen is much more sophisticated and has a lot of the similar biochemical uh, processes as humans, boy, are you going to have a difficult time trying to find something that will kill the, the uh, pathogen but not kill the patient. Now, the activity of these differences, as I mentioned, is based on differences, you know, ribosome, gene expression, cell wall, cell structure, chemistry. Ideally, all drugs would be completely non-toxic to humans. That's not true, though. Also, some drugs will exhibit toxic effects after a period of, of drug exposure. So sometimes what doctors will do is say, I'll allow the patient to go on this drug for a set period of time, seven days, but certainly not 30 days or 60 days. Forget it. They know that that would start having adverse effects on kidneys, on liver, on metabolism, things like that. Also, some drugs are only suited for topical use and not systemic application. Here's one, uh, polymyxin B, otherwise known as uh, colistin. Hey, folks, you use that in that triple antibiotic ointment that you put on your scratches, you know, or the kids' boo-boos. You wouldn't inject it into a patient. Colistin does have some use, but it has a higher toxicity, and that's why it's now preferred as being a uh, topical rather than systemic use. Also, you're going to have to carefully monitor to prevent toxic buildup in the patient. you got to keep in mind, does the patient have poor drug excretion rate? Is it because of the drug or because they're having problems with their liver, their kidneys, <clears throat> excuse me, even bowel movements? Because some drugs do not get excreted by the urine, but only get excreted by the fecal matter. Okay. There is a term, therapeutic index. This is the ratio of the minimum toxic dose to the minimum effective dose of the medication. Now, if you've got a big therapeutic index, great, because that means you've got a huge range that you can use the drug before you start having, because it's effective at, at the lower amounts, before you start having uh, any sign of toxic effects. If you've got a very narrow therapeutic index, ew, that's gonna be dicey. You're gonna have to monitor the patient for any signs of toxic effects. Also, <clears throat> what you have to keep in mind is that high therapeutic index are less toxic. And many times that's because the drug acts on biochemical processes that are completely unique to bacterial cells only. For example, penicillin G inhibits bacterial cell wall synthesis. You and I don't have bacterial cell walls, so we don't even have to worry about that. Okay? Just to give you some things to think about. Let's also talk about terms of action. When we talk about something being a bacteria stat, bacteria static, these are drugs that inhibit the growth of the bacteria, yet the host immune system then must eliminate the presence of the bacteria cells. So bacteria cells are still there, but they're not eliminated. They depend upon uh, your immune system to clean them out. The only difference is that the bacteria cells will not undergo binary fission and hence are sort of put on the brakes. But then you still got to mop them up with some other form of removal, and that may be just your own immune system. Bactericidal, C-I-D-A-L, refers to killing. These drugs will actually kill the bacteria cells. This is very useful, especially when the host immune system cannot be counted on to remove the bacteria cells. <clears throat> so in other words, if you had a person with a normal immune system, you might favor a bacteria stat over a bactericidal in certain cases. But if you had somebody who was immunocompromised, you would probably have to go for almost all the time bactericidal drugs because those drugs are going to kill the, the uh, bacterial infection and the host's immune system just can't do it. Also, you want to be aware of one other thing. Some drugs are bactericidal or bacteriostatic, and it just depends on the dose of the drug. Now, we, we are going to hear these terms repeatedly. I want you to be aware of them. Narrow spectrum drug, broad spectrum. Narrow spectrum drugs work on a very limited range of bacteria. They might only work on tuberculosis cells. They might work on uh, mycoplasms. They might work on only gram such and such. But broad spectrum work in a large, broad range. So all gram positive cells, all gram negative cells, gram positive and some gram negative cells. Those are broad spectrum. The problem with broad spectrum is that they tend to disrupt the normal 
flora of the bacteria in the host resulting in other possible infections like C. diff, uh, Clostridium difficile, which we'll get into later on. Distribution, excretion, metabolism. Okay, now this is why we had, you make sure that you really got down the A and P, the anatomy and physiology. Because the distribution depends on the water solubility, lipid solubility, acid stability. Remember, if it's ingested as a pill, it's got to go in the stomach, and that stomach's got a low pH. Each factor can influence how the drug is administered, as well as the timing of the doses used. Also, is the drug absorbed by the intestine? Will the drug cross the blood-brain barrier? All right. These are a few thoughts, and then I'm going to bring up a couple of other ones. The excretion is really dependent on how the body enzymes act on the drug. How is the drug excreted via the stools or urine or both? If it's urine, you definitely are looking at water solubility. If it's stools, it's possible it's water solubility. Uh, metabolism, how does the body's enzymes act on the drug? Is the drug altered by digestive acids or enzymes? Is it a prodrug, which is converted to an active form via enzymes such as protonzocil? How long is the drug in active form? in the body, as this affects the next dosage is required. If anybody has had your uh, azithromycin, the z packs, okay? Take two pills the first day, then take one more pill for the next subsequent days, which means about five days. Drug's gonna be in your system to, for a good 10 days or so. That's it. Makes it real easy for people with a busy lifestyle, okay? Now, here's another important point. How is the drug metabolized by the bacteria cells? How long is the drug taken up by the bacteria cells? Keep this in mind, because later on we're going to talk about resistance. And bacteria, some, have drug pumps that will pump products out of the cell. That's part of their resistance. When we talk about half-life, this is the time rate of a, for elimination of drug from the body. The key determination factor for the time course of a drug treatment. When we talk about half-life of medication, this is where you're going to have more details. You know, it is the time that the drug takes for the serum concentration of the drug to decrease by 50%. This influences the frequency of doses necessary to maintain the effective levels of the drug. For example, penicillin D. Its half-life is 45 minutes. The excretion is by tubular secretion into the urine. Oops, tubular secretion. Yeah, that's the kidney. If you're not sure about that, review it. In the nephron, there's a process, tubular secretion pumps it into the urine, and therefore, that is why the drug needs to be taken four times each day. Azithromycin, z packs here we go, 68 hours for a half-life. It's excreted by biliary excretion, therefore the drug needs to be taken only once a day. If you're not familiar with that, biliary excretion is basically, it gets processed by the liver, it gets passed into the bile, and then when you have a fatty meal, what happens? You need to have that, um, detergent-like property of bile. And so when the bile is dumped into the duodenum, then you're going to see the possibility of excretion via the feces, okay? Now, let me give you one that's a really cool one. Years ago, I had a, a, I had sort of like, they said, irregular, irritable bowel or something, whatever. And the doctor put me on Rizamphimin, which is also goes by Zyfaxin. Listen, it's got less than 0.4% bioavailability, which translates to it does not show up in your blood. It does not show up in serum. It does not get absorbed by the intestine. It stays in the gut. Now, it's used for irritable bowel syndrome, traveler's diarrhea. It's also for some other unique things. The reason being is that the molecule is a mega, mega cyclic structure. And so what happens is it's just so big that it can't be picked up by the intestine, put into the blood or into the lymph uh, material, like with fatty material. And so it doesn't go anywhere. It stays in the gut, but that's where you want it to be useful in treating the patient. Okay, so let's continue. Now, effects of drug antimicrobial uh, combinations. Some drugs are given in combination to enhance the effectiveness against the pathogen. If we use the term synergistic, the action of one drug enhances the activity of another. If we talk about antagonistic, that's the drug combination in which the activity of one drug interferes with the activity of another drug. Anybody know anybody that said, well, I was on the birth control pill, 
and I was taking antibiotics, and that's how little Janie or Joey uh, occurred. Don't laugh, and it's not meant to be flippant or disrespectful. This happens. Some drugs will cause interference with cer certain forms of other drugs, such as birth control pills, and so the individual is told, if you're going to have this and this, you may not want to um, do something because the pill may not be, the birth control pill may not be as effective, okay? And we're talking about additive. This is where drug effects occur, where the combination is neither antagonistic nor synergistic. Now, let's talk briefly for adverse effects. Drugs can have adverse effects. These effects can occur in all or few of the patients using the drug. Now, keep in mind, we have genetic variation within the population, okay? So some individuals are going to report this. If you ever listen to the drug uh, uh, commercials, they'll say uh, adverse effects have been reported in 2% of the population for this or that or this or this or this or that. That's what they're trying to say. And I'll get into a little bit of how this is determined in a few minutes. But when we talk about adverse effects, they can be allergic reactions, usually hypersensitivity or allergies. They require the patient to communicate this to the physician. This can develop into a full blast anaphylactic shock. Some people are allergic to penicillin. Some people are allergic to sulfur drugs. For example, toxic effects. Some drugs are too toxic for systemic use. Some drugs have such a low therapeutic index and patients using these drugs must be closely monitored. The aminoglycosides can damage the kidneys, destroy hair cells in the inner ear. If you're not familiar with hair cells, these are the cells in the cochlea that basically make it possible for you to hear. And also there's some hair cells that are in uh, the, the vestibule structure next to the cochlea. And that is involved with the sense of uh, detection of motion and balance and everything else. And so forth, certain drugs can damage not only kidneys, but lead to deafness or an impaired sense of balance. And that's why it's very, very important to monitor for these drugs. Also, we know this very clearly now. A certain antimicrobial compounds will suppress the normal microbiota, uh, for example, in the gut or in the vagina. And the antibiotics that are broad spectrum, a lot of times will kill these off. And this tends to lead to a subsequent hostile presence of normally uh, pathogens that have been normally suppressed by the normal microbiota. Women that report uh, vaginal yeast infections after being on a series of uh, prolonged antibiotics. Uh, individuals reporting uh, gastrointestinal problems after being on antibiotics. Now, there is a term you need to be aware of, and that's called dysbiosis, and that's the imbalance of microbial population. Antibiotic-associated colitis. This is a life-threatening disease caused by the suppression of normal intestinal microbiota and the emergence of toxin-producing strains of Clostridium difficile in the intestine. The normal microbiota would suppress any chance of C. diff to proliferate, but because those have been wiped out, a lot of times what happens then is C. diff will proliferate now. Nature pours a vacuum. Um, if the opponents have been wiped out, that particular strain of bacteria can proliferate. Uh, I do believe I meant I have a YouTube video in the antibiotic lab section on C. diff, if not in the lecture section for this particular lecture. Do take some time to review it. It's going to be extremely relevant for he all healthcare professionals. Antibiotic resistance. Now, remember that acquired resistance can occur via mutations in the bacterial genome, that usually is a slower process, or by receiving genes for antibiotic resistance from other resistant strains. That can occur through conjugation, transformation, and virally mediated transduction. Remember all that stuff that you kind of went, huh, what? That's why you need to learn it. There's a couple of other issues to deal with when it comes to antibiotic resistance. There's two major types. Intrinsic, this is known as the innate resistance, the resistance to an antimicrobial uh, compound due to the inherent characteristics of the type of organism. Here's an example. Penicillin's actions on the cell wall do not work on mycobacterium tuberculosis or mycoplasma species because neither of these species have a cell wall. That would be like throwing a rock to fight the ocean monster. If the ocean monster is made of water, a rock isn't going to stop. Maybe it's a bad analogy, but I think you get the point. Why give an antibiotic 
when the uh, pathogen has no cell wall, and therefore the antibiotic's not going to work against it. Now, the other type of antimicrobial resistance is called acquired. This is development of antimicrobial resistance in a previously sensitive organism. Now, usually what happens is this is due to a mutation or a gene transfer from a resistant species. That's why we get all upset and worry so much when new strains exist, because if they exist in one teeny tiny little area, they're probably already starting to spread, even with your best intentions of containment. And if they spread there, there probably are other places that they've already spread. And we can get into that later on. What are the costs? Well, let me explain to you that this is an issue that I know of to a point because I used to uh, advise uh, pharmaceutical and biotech firms for a, a think tank in Connecticut for about four years. And you learn a lot. Now, let me help you to understand something. The costs are much greater today than previously due to considerations for safety, research, and development. But basically, from the lab to market, a recent study cited said the cost for getting a drug from the very first Eureka we found it in the lab to, hi, you can pick it up at your CVS today, is about $658 million, and on average, 7 to 10 years time period. Now, you have to understand something, that once you discover something and you put out for a patent for it, the patent, which gives you market exclusivity and a means to basically recoup your investment, lasts only 20 years. By the way, it used to be in the United States 15 years, and there was a time before that it was 12 years. In the only recent couple of decades have we moved it up to about 20 years. But you think about it, 20 years, okay, fine. But if it takes me 10 years to get the drug approved by the FDA and done all the tests necessary, and it can now be sell, sold, it's going to account for some of that cost because it took me that much money to go out there and invest in to make the drug. And by the way, not all drugs pass. What's the pass? Pass the testing process and the phase trials. Now, after you have lab trials and animal trials, these are preclinical trials, you have costs involved in ramping up the production. You have to remember that World War II production of penicillin was limited due to the huge manpower required in culturing the fungi to obtain small amounts of penicillin. They would have hundreds of people working with thousands of these little small culture dishes to grow these blobs of fungi. And then they would take the fungi, put it all together, and then do the chemical processing and purify, etc. So usually during World War II, Penicillin was reserved not for the civilian population, but for the military, just for the boys in the field, because those are the ones that were most likely have wounds that led to infections that may lead to things like losing an arm, losing a leg, things like that. After you get all your basic lab trials and animal trials done, you have to have this nice and neatly put together in a document, handed to the FDA. The Food and Drug Administration <clears throat> will grant permission via what is called an Investigational New Drug Filing, IND. When the IND is filed, you have to then go through three phase trials with human beings. They ask certain questions in each trial. First trial, phase one, is it safe to use? So they use a small group of patients. Phase two, how does it work? Does it really work? Another small group of patients. Phase three, they ask again, how does it compare to other drugs? that treat the disease, as well as look for any rare adverse effects. This is where you use a larger group of patients. All of that clinical data is recorded, and then you file the uh, new drug announcement. The FDA has a bunch of doctors and researchers, and they look over the findings, and they may grant marketing permission. They may also deny it or may hold it off by basically saying, more data is needed here. We've got concerns A, B, C, and D. And so that can really slow up the process of new de drug development. Now let's talk about the mechanism of actions. You can see this on page, uh, excuse me, on figure 20.3. The strategies, you're going to be seeing those in a label uh, which is posted for table 21, 20.1.
All antimicrobials act either to inhibit a biochemical process or destroy a structural component of the bacterial cell. So you can see all of this. Nucleic acid synthesis is inhibited. <clears throat> Excuse me. Cell wall synthesis is inhibited or interfered with. The cell uh, membrane integrity can be interfered with. Metabolic pathways, such as the foliate synthesis, can be interfered with. And then protein synthesis. So let's go over them. With cell wall synthesis inhibitors, now you can go back to table 3.5. You can go back and review the, the, the sophistication of the cell walls, which I encourage you to do. Looks something like this. Most of these drugs act on the structural support of NAM and NAG and the peptide side chains. Beta-lactam drugs irreversibly inhibit enzymes involved in the final steps of the cell wall synthesis. Penicillin binding proteins, these are enzymes that mediate the formation of the bridges between the adjacent strands of the peptidoglycan. And with the cell walls weakened, the cell will lyse through basically due to osmotic pressure. Then you have all the beta-lactam drugs that have the beta-lactam ring. And by the way, this is the rupture image that you see here. It's kind of an older image, but it's a great image. Because here's the thing, the structural integrity is weakened by penicillin, and you see the cells will balloon out, and then they burst. As you can see here, this is the beta-lactam ring. Notice the similarity between penicillin and cephalosporins, okay? Now, resistance to these drugs is usually due to an enzyme called beta-lactamase. ASE is involving uh, referring to an enzyme. You have decreased affinity of the penicillin binding proteins, decreased uptake of the drug. Beta-lactamase, by the way, what it usually does is it severs and breaks open the ring, and so that basically neutralizes the drug. Now, there is some other possibilities here. But before that, let me just bring up this point. If you notice the similarities in all these different drugs, some of them you probably recognize, familiarize, amoxicillin, amphicillin, et cetera, methicillin, the beta-lactam ring is existing in all of them, and then they have these interesting side chains that enhance or make something very specific, okay? Now, here's how you're able to get around some of this. What they will do, for example, there is a uh, drug called Augmentin. Really what Augmentin does is it contains amoxicillin, which is a type of penicillin, and clavulonic acid. It is a beta-lactamase inhibitor. And that basically, this dual one-two punch, uh, the inhibitor will protect the drug from enzymatic destruction while the amoxicillin will destroy uh, the cell wall. Now, cephalosporins are an antibiotic uh, derived from Acrimonium cephalosporium. At least five generations exist, and each generation has been chemically modified with later generations against gram-negative bacteria and beta-lactam resistance. Oh, by the way, we have several other drugs out there, too. Let me go back here for a second so that you can see this here. We've talked about cephalosporins. What about carbapenins and monobactams are very resistant to beta-lactamases? Imipenem also, is also a carbapenem, is rapidly destroyed by a kidney enzyme. It must be administered by an inhibitor to that enzyme. Carbapenems are effective against a wide range of gram-negative and gram-positive bacteria. Vancomycins bind to the terminal amino acid of the peptide side chain of NAM. They're very effective on gram-positive, but not on gram-negative bacteria. This is especially important for gram-positive bacteria that are resistant to beta-lactam drugs. And then we have bactatracin. Bactatracin inhibits cell wall synthesis by interfering with the transport of peptidoglycan precursors across the cytoplasmic membrane. Problem. Toxicity limits. That's why bactatracin, if you, you see that triple antibiotic cream that they use on, you know, again, cuts and scrapes, that's where bactatracin will be used. So it's used for topical use only. Now let's go back up here to the really cool area, protein synthesis inhibitors. Remember the, the organelle that's really important? That's the ribosome. Now usually that's the focus of action on a bacterial ribosome. Remember that it has a different 
uh, large and small subunit than human eukaryotics. Okay, eukaryotic cells. Uh, since the mito mitochondria has ribosomes similar to bacteria cells, some of the drugs may be toxic as they inhibit the function of mitochondrial protein synthesis. So you have to keep that in mind. If you remember your basic cell biology from A and P, the mitochondria have their own DNA, RNA, and ribosomes, and the ribosomes are very similar to bacteria. So they have to keep that in monitoring as they go along. Now, aminoglycosides bind to the 30S subunit. It's irreversible and causes distortion and shape warping. And that way it will stop the uh, protein synthesis step. Many of these are too toxic for systemic application or used topically. They include streptomycin, gentamycin, tobramycin, amikakin, amikakin. Now, tetracyclines reversibly bind to the 30S subunit. They block attachment of the transfer RNA to the ribosome and prevent protein synthesis from continuing. This is actively transported into bacteria cells and can cause, unfortunately, discoloration of young children's teeth. Uh, the tetracyclines include tetracycline and doxycycline. They're effective against certain gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria. The macrolids reversibly bind to the 50S subunit. They're effective against many types of bacteria, including gram-positive, but not effective against Enterobacteria AC. These include, of course, erythromycin, clathromycin, azithromycin. Now, chloramphenicol binds to the 50S subunit. It prevents peptide bond synthesis. It's, but due to a rare toxicity, which is uh, unfortunately aplastic anemia, which is the inability to form red and white blood cells, a lot of times chloramphenicol is used as a drug of last resort. Lincosamines bind to the 50S subunit. They prevent uh, protein synthesis. They're great for treating bacterioides fragilis, which is due to an intestinal perforation infections. So in other words, if you have a patient coming in, they've been uh, knifed or they've gotten shot through the gut, the gut will release the bacteria into the peritoneum. And so it's nice, warm and moist and lots of nutrients. So these bacteria will proliferate. This is one of the drugs that's used. They can also be used to treat Clostridium difficile infections. Now, now the oxazolinolds are a new class of antimicrobials that bind to the 50S subunit, interfere with initiation of protein synthesis. They're very effective on gram-positive bacteria. The first one used was linozoid, excuse me, linozoilid, thank you. The plurimultilins have been used for years in animals. There is only one derivative approved for human use. This is a situation, and this is called Retoparum nolin, and it binds to the 50S subunit. It's very active against many types of gram-positive bacteria. Now you're sitting there going, what do you mean it's been used for animals for years? One of the sad realities is, going back to the 70s and 80s, was to enhance growth and building up of the, the beefiness and the muscularness of cattle for meat production, they would add antibiotics to the feed. And what happens is they found out that some of the bacteria coming out from the manure of these animals was now showing signs of antibiotic resistance. And so that got to be a concern. Now, streptogramins, this is a drug composed, a combination that binds two different sites on the 50S subunit to inhibit protein synthesis. Synersid, which is composed of quinupristin and dolphopristin, are effective against gram-positive bacteria. Let's go over to the nucleic acid inhibitors. <clears throat> First you have, we're not there yet, just hang in there, fluoroquinolins, which include cipro, ciprofloxacin, monofloxacin, ofloxacin. These inhibit the toporal isomerases, including DNA gyrase. In other words, these are the enzymes that maintain uh, the supercoiling of the bacteria DNA, even during unwinding. And so what happens is they're required during gene transcription or DNA replication. Um, what happens basically is why these drugs alone, you inhibit gene expression and bacteria cell reproduction. The drug class is bactericidal against many gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria. 
Uh, but they've found that there has been some acquired resistance due to alternations of the DNA gyrase target. In other words, small mutations showing up in the DNA, DNA gyrase enzyme have now led to problems. Rifamycins block prokaryotic RNA polymerase from initiating transcription. Rifampin is a bactericidal against many gram-positive and some gram-negative bacteria, primarily used to treat mycobacterium species, including, yes, tuberculosis and those that cause Hansen's disease, leprosy. Resistance can rapidly occur due to mutations of the RNA polymerase. Now, uh, metrodiazinol, otherwise known as flagell, interferes with DNA synthesis and function, leads to, uh, leads to strand breakdown. It's not stand, but strand, sorry. Strand break, breaks in the DNA strands, but only in anaerobic organisms. The anaerobes convert the drug to active form, and it's used to treat bacterial vaginosis, Clostridium difficile infections, things like that. Now we come up to the metabolic pathway inhibitors, and I have two of them here. Uh, sulfanamides. They're commonly called sulfa drugs. They inhibit growth of many of the gram-positive, gram-negative bacteria by blocking the enzyme pathway to folic acid, which is used in the synthesis of nucleotides. Uh, sulfonamide is structurally similar to para-aminobenzoic acid, okay? And so basically that is one of the, um, I believe it's one of the coenzymes um, to assist the enzyme in being able to do the process from going from pre precursor one to precursor two. Now, sulfa drugs are one, but trimethoprin inhibits the bacterial enzyme that catalyzes a metabolic step in the synthesis of folic acid, two steps after sulfonamides, and the combination of these is used synergistically to treat urinary infections, okay? What about cell membrane integrity disruptors? And you see all this on 20.1 table. Polymyxin B disturbs the uh, bacterial cell membrane and it, by binding to the cell membrane and altering the cell membrane permeability. This is also known as colistatin, and this is due basically due to toxicity considerations. And you basically will see polymyxin be used for topical ointments only. That's in the triple antibiotic cream that they use sometimes. You'll see this referred sometimes, that when doctors are down to absolutely nothing, they'll try to use colistatin. But, and here's the big but, it's terrifying when the doctor sits there and finds out, hey, this strain is resistant to colistatin too. Uh, this is starting to be reported in European uh, medical papers. They're finding colistatin resistance, and when that's it, it's usually, well, I have to go in and tell the patient that basically they're going to suffer and die, and that's it. And it's very upsetting. I, I've actually seen some interviews with physicians. You can see they're almost ready to cry. They're like, you know, they're not prepared to, to deal with this. You know, it's one thing to have somebody die of a heart attack. It's another thing to say, I'm sorry, you're going to have this bacteria overgrowth and it's going to kill you. And I don't have any drugs that can help you. Okay, something to think about. Drugs targeted at mycobacterium tuberculosis. There's a limited range of drugs that act on mycobacterium tuberculosis. Okay, yes, the TB. Now, here's part of the situation. Remember, TB, tuberculosis, the mycobacteria has a slow growth rate, basically duplication roughly every 24 hours. They have an absence of a cell wall, and they have a waxy cell wall. They've got a different set, not phospholipids, okay? So what happens? The first line of drugs, this is the preferred line, ramphifin, streptomycin, isonazid, ethamibutanol, paracetamamine, are used due to their low toxicity and high effectiveness. Generally, they're given in combination if a patient has active TB, tuberculosis. The second line of drugs, ampicillin clavulonic acid, aminoglycosides like canamycin, capriomycin, amicacin, and clathrinomycin are used if the first line drugs cannot be used, but they are more toxic and less effective. Now, what would that cause? This is where you get into the, the terrifying concept of multi-drug resistant TB. 
Okay? MDR-TB is becoming worldwide. And so if the first line doesn't work, then they have to shoot over to the second line drugs. It has been reported in Russian prisons that they have what's called XDR-TB, which means extreme drug resistance. They are resistant to many different drugs, and therefore that is terrifying. And as I've talked to some people from Russia, they said basically there is not much sympathy for anybody in the prison, and they don't treat the patients. Okay, but the problem is what if the patients or their disease gets outside those prisons, then you're going to have a serious outbreak of some really nasty disease and many people suffering and dying. Isoazimid inhibits the synthesis of mycolic acids. This is the primary component of the cell membrane. I know I said wall, but eh, it's actually a waxy cell wall or cell membrane. And Ethamabutanol inhibits enzymes required for other cell wall components. And parazidamine inhibits the process to restart stalled ribosomes. For more clarity there, TB has sort of a cell wall, but it's very what they refer to as waxy, mycolic acids, things like that. It is definitely not what you see for like NAM and NAG and stuff like that. Also, it doesn't have the, the shape configuration. We'll get into this later when we get into TB. Uh, it's more pleomorphic. It's not round. It's not rod-shaped or bacilli, et cetera. Now, antimicrobial uh, susceptibility testing. Okay. This is where we start getting into some very interesting research. Some of these things you've already been experienced with a little bit already. When we talk about MYC, Minimum inhibitory concentration. This is the lowest concentration of a specific drug that prevents the growth of the organism in vitro. Now, keep in mind, in vitro means in glass, on a Petri dish, in a test tube. It is not in the body, because in the body, there's going to be other biochemical variables occurring. That's why you do the lab studies first, then you test it out in human beings. You do the lab studies first, uh, and then you test them on the animals. Then you test them on the human beings. That's the better way to put it. Minimum bactericidal concentration. This is the lowest concentration of a specific drug that kills 99.9% .9 of a given strain of bacteria. Since some drugs are bacteriostat only, the bacteria culture after treatment by the drug must be introduced into a drug-free culture to determine if the bacteria have been killed or just merely inhibited from the growth. Okay? And you can see this as they set up an MIC for the antimicrobial medication. Notice that you get cloudiness there. That's kind of like the like faded orange versus the purple. Uh, if you look at the uh, middle one, for example, the resultant MIC is one microgram per milliliter. This is on your figure 20.9 in your chapter. And the reason being is that at 1.0, those tubes are not uh, loaded up with bacteria. They're, they're killed. There's no bacteria. And go back to the controls, okay? So let's move on. Now, we can do dilutional assays, which we just saw. And that's basically where you put the drug in a standard bacteria culture and set up. And the result in turbidity, the sign of bacteria growth, determines the effective dosage. But now let's talk about disc diffusion. Remember, this is Kirby Bauer discs. Kirby Bauer discs are paper discs that have set amount of drug, which will diffuse into the surrounding agar in a plate culture. So you're going to have this radial diffusion going out in all directions, okay, round all directions around it. This is a standard test to quantitatively determine the susceptibility of a given organism to a battery of antimicrobial drugs. The drugs diffuse into the agar at a rate inversely proportional to the molecular size of the drug molecule. To help you, what that means, small molecule, rapid diffusion. Large molecule, slower diffusion. The bottom line is, okay, how much of this and does this actually inhibit or kill off a susceptible strain? The zone of inhibition, that's the zone of clearance surrounding the Kirby Bauer disk and demonstrates where the bacteria are able to grow. And this is due to the adverse effects of the compound in the disk. The zone size is influenced by characteristics of the drug, including molecular weight, stability of the drug, and concentration of the drug in the disc. So they might use uh, a bunch of different discs with varying concentrations 
of the same drug to see its effect. And that is also an indication of uh, MIC, minimum inhibitory concentration. Now, there are, of course, other commercial methods. And here's a Kirby Bauer here, and here is an E strip. This is a commercial strip, which is impregnated with varying concentrations of the drug to be studied. The strip is laid down onto a culture plate, and you get a teardrop-shaped zone of inhibition, which you see in the upper one where the green is actually the bacteria. And the inhibition area is that clear area. You see it looks like, kind of like a teardrop, wide at the higher dosages, narrow at the decreasing dosages, but at the point where you have growth, that is just scale it back just one item, and that is where you have the minimum inhibitory concentration, okay, or the minimum effective dosage. Now, microweld plates, this is where you get into lots and lots of automation. We're culturing um, the organisms in wells exposed to varying amounts of drug. The turbidity of the well determines the bacteria growth and effectiveness. Now, we also have here microcard systems. This is even more in interesting because of the fact that you can really automate this. So you can try all different strains of bacteria, put all the strains on, you know, different strains on different cards, put in differing amounts of the concentration. You can tell whether or not there's going to be turbidity or clearness. There's clearness, obviously. Uh, also, you have to put in a mathematical formula. But the computer will analyze all of these cards, and then it will give you a readout of strain of bacteria, minimum inhibitory concentration. Um, it will tell you all the different strains, and it, it's fascinating. You can do huge amounts of stuff. In other words, think about it this way. If each one of those wells, each one of those tiny wells was the equivalent of a Petri dish, think about the hundreds and hundreds of Petri dishes that would have to be analyzed. And that's what used to happen, folks, in the 50s and 60s. Now, of course, a lot of this is automated. Okay? Now, let us move from here to some of the issues about drug resistance. Okay? you got to keep in mind that drug resistance to penicillin was even recorded as early as 1946. Think about it, folks. Just a year after World War II. And they didn't have mass distribution of penicillin yet, but they were already seeing some reports of resistance in 1946. Now, the presence of re resistant strains has led to the resurgence in antimicrobial research and development in the pharmaceutical industry and in microbiological centers. That's it. They've just been going at it since they've said, oh, no, no more magic bullets and time is running out. And so they are searching everywhere, anywhere, soils, underwater, um, inside of organisms. They're looking at all sorts of different variations to substances that would stop the growth of uh, microbes. We'll get to some interesting ones toward the end. Now, as a mechanism, there are various strategies that exist. Now, by the way, when you're looking at this screen here, keep in mind one thing. See lots of bacteria at the top of this. This is figure 20.13. The idea is this. In essence, the antimicrobial medication selects for the sensitive strains. The resistant strain survives. That's why they tell you to take all your drugs. But why? Because, well, you know, if uh, let's say you don't take it for the full time necessary, what happens is you can lead to the possibility of the development of a resistant strain. The survivors will basically be able to multiply without any competition from the sensitive strains, and they will thrive now because basically they're resistant to that particular antibiotic. Now, there are, vol there are various strategies that exist for antibiotic resistance. Drug inactivating enzymes. The bacteria will acquire and develop enzymes that chemically alter or break down the antimicrobial drugs. Penicillinase is very well known, acts on penicillin. There is another one called chloramphenicol acetyltransferase. It breaks down chloramphenicol. Alterations of the target molecule. Usually by small mutations, the target molecule can evade the binding of the drug. So remember where the target is. The target could be a certain enzyme in the folic acid steps. It could be um, the small or large subunit 
of uh, basically the, the ribosomes. Also, you have decreased uptake of the drug. Now, porin proteins in the gram-negative uh, strains play a key role in drug transport. Usually, they're going to transport small hydrophobic molecules, but mutations and changes in the porin proteins can alter the drug entry. You also have increased elimination of the drug. The bacteria have these efflux pumps. Uh, these are protein pumps that remove detrimental compounds out of the cell. If you have any alteration, mutations, and pump proteins, they can affect the rate of drug elimination from the cell cytoplasm. Now, mutations in the efflux protein may increase the range of drugs being pumped out of the cell. Keep in mind, we're not dealing with a single cell. If you deal with a huge population of cells and each one has slight different mutations of this and that and the other thing, some of them, as a result of these little changes, may be resistant to this antibiotic or that. And then as time goes on, the resistant strains become much more prevalent within the population, whether we're talking about a person's body or a, or a whole population of human beings. Okay. Now, how do we acquire this resistance? Well, <laughs> brings us back to some bacterial genetics. When we talk about vertical evolution, this is acquiring resistance through spontaneous mutation and affects only progeny of the mutated cell. Okay. And you can see that up there. You see this in figure 2014. But horizontal evolution is the acquisition of drug resistance through gene transfer. A lot of times they'll be on the R plasmids. These plasmids get transferred. And so cell A, B, and C now suddenly become cell A, B, C resistant. Okay. It's much more serious as unrelated organisms can now acquire new traits this way. In other words, if it was gram positive and it was gram positive and it was gram positive, and now these gram positives pass it on to somehow a gram negative in one way or another, now you have not only gram positive but gram negative resistant to this antimicrobial. You also have spontaneous mutations. This normally occurs at low rates, but just one cell that acquires the mutation can become the parent cell of an entire new strain of drug-resistant cells. Now, this may require multi-drug usage. This is where we get into the concept of combination therapy to assure suppression of any mutants that arise with a single drug resistance. See, the idea is that with multi-drug resistance from mutants occurring at the same time, this is going to be highly unlikely. That's why what happened also with the antiviral drugs dealing with HIV, if you gave a drug cocktail, it was sufficient to kill off all the strains, even if a few of them had uh, resistance to drug A and one, and some of them had resistance to drug B. All of them didn't have resistance to drug A, B, and C. And so adding them all together, we were able to damp down and wipe out the, the uh, viruses. You also have to keep in mind that, you know, you have drink, gene transfer, which has been talked about. Uh, most commonly, it's the uh, conjugative transfer of the R plasmid, which may carry genes for multi-drug resistance. Many drug-resistant genes are carried from plasma to plasma via transposons also. And if one organism has two different plasmids for drug resistance, genes from one plasmid may be transferred to the other plasmid, converting a narrow host-range plasmid to a wide host-range plasmid. This plasma can be transferred to unrelated bacteria. And we take a look, if you move into the case presentation on 20.1, um, it gets very interesting, but I'll tell you what, if you go over to table 20.2, this is where we have examples of a lot of resistance today. Entrococci, normally intrinsically less susceptible to many common antimicrobials. Some strains exist as VRE, vancomycin-resistant entrococci that are resistant to vancomycin. Staphylococcus aureus, you've heard of MRSA. Methylicin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, okay? V Visa, vancomycin intermediate S. aureus strains have appeared and require strict hospital guidelines to prevent the spread of these strains. Enterobacteria C. some strains have developed beta-lactamase, hence are resistant to ampicillin and other penicillins, 
Others have extended spectrum beta lactamases, ESBLs. They are now resistant to most cephalosporins and monobactams, as well as penicillin. Nesseria gonorrhea. Some have penicillinase and thus resistant to penicillin for STDs. Resistance to tetracyclines, macrolids, and fluoroquinins also exist. Recent data has found that resistance to cephalotron strains exist. Modern treatment requires combinational therapy. Uh, Cephalaxotron in combination with either azithromycin or doxycycline. I can tell you this. There have been very, very serious concerns about multidrug resistant strains of uh, and gonorrhea uh, in the Korean Peninsula, particularly from the military. And I know everybody could smirk and go, well, that's because the guys are doing you know what afterwards, maybe. But the problem is that once that gets out and gets to Asia, North America, et cetera, it's going to create real problems in controlling uh, what was an easily controllable STD uh, some decades ago. Now, Staphylococcus pneumoniae. Some strains have acquired mutations to the penicillin binding proteins and thus appear to be a beta lactam resistant. This is not due to the formation of beta lactamase. Okay? Mycobacterium tuberculosis. The treatment of active infections requires a combination of two or more drugs for a period of, ready? six months or more. Multidrug resistance is necessary due to the, the possibility of mutants with single drug resistance, due to patients skipping drug regimes, abandoning the treatment. MDR-TB, which is multidrug resistant uh, mycoplasma tuberculosis, has arisen and has resistance to isonazid or rifampicin. XDR-TB, extensively drug resistant tuberculosis is TB that is resistant to treatment of isonazid, ranfavin, and three or more second-line anti-TB medications. And by the way, this is not just occurring in Russian prisons. The reports have been uh, TB and some MDR-TBs showing up in various uh, cities across the United States in the homeless. Now, part of this is because the homeless have a difficulty in basically being tracked and being able to uphold a regime of six months or more of antibiotic treatment. Also, some of them are um, mentally ill. And so it's hard to get them to, co to com consistently take their medication. Um, and so that has led to real problems within the urban centers of the country. Okay. What are some of the strategies of slow resistance? Physicians and healthcare workers must prescribe suitable antimicrobials. They must also educate the patient on the usage and timely application of the drugs. Patients must take their drugs on prescribed times only and faithfully use the drug. In other words, use it all up, folks. Global community must continue to monitor and report outbreaks of drug-resistant strains and prevent the transport of strains to other parts of the world. That's where some of the videos that I gave you on drug resistance are going to be very helpful. By the way, one more thing before we go into antivirals. Um, you need to be able to look at some of the uh, rates of antimicrobial prescriptions that exist in this country. This is figure 2015. And stewardship is really, really difficult to self-monitor oneself. Um, probably you're familiar with the situations where patients are coming in, all the symptoms appear to be viral, a cold or something else like that. No need for antimicrobial, but the patients absolutely insist. Now the doctors are having to be pushed into a situation of, no, I should not give this to you. In the, in the 70s, they were much more willing to give it as sort of a prophylactic or protection, but they knew pretty much, now this is viral. Now they, they can't afford to play around with this because the day will come soon that that strain of bacteria is resistant and you're going to have no more bullets in the gun to treat these ailments. Let's move on to antiviral drugs. Now, since the viruses have require a unique cellular machinery to reproduce, reproduce, there are many limitations of drug targets. In other words, think about it this way. 
as we went over the chapter on viruses, viruses do what? They invade, they infect the cell, they take over some of the cellular machinery so that they can use the ribosomes of the eukaryotic organism, you and me, and the T RNAs, the transfer RNAs, to basically make now the viral proteins and copies. You'll use uh, the RNA polymerase or whatever to make the copies of the viral RNA or viral DNA, etc. So it gets to be really difficult. Now, many viruses have their own polymerases, or they encode specific enzymes for viral structure, viral function, and some possess unique means to produce proteins. All of these unique components are targets for a viral drug development. Also, the process by which viruses enter the cell or leave the cell can be an antiviral drug target. Uh, drugs that prevent viral entry, um, I would encourage you to also take a peek later on when we talk about um, HIV, but we're going to do that later on in the course. It's coming up, though. And on 754, there is a figure 2724. You can take some time to review that. But drugs used to treat HIV infection, some of the drugs block viral attachment entry into the host cell. And furotide binds to the HIV protein that promotes the fusion of the viral envelope with cell membrane. Maraviroc blocks the HIV co-receptor CCR5. Now, Drugs that act on viral encoding, as the virion enters the cells, okay, you have the virus must attach to the cell and enter the cell and remove the protein coat to unleash the viral nucleic acid for viral replication. Okay, amantadine and rimantadine block vi uh, influenza A virus from encoding it after it has entered the cell. Here's the problem. How come I can't get it? I've got the flu. Resistance to the drug can develop, and so it is uh, prescribed very, very sparingly, okay? And that's why it's limited in its use. Nucleotide analogs. What you will see as we go here and here. The most effective strategies exploit the error-prone viral enzymes involved in the viral replication of nucleic acids. Use of these drugs is limited to treating infections caused by herpes viruses and HIV. Nucleus, nucleoside analogs, drugs that are similar in structure to the nucleoside, the nucleoside analog will be phosphorylated into the nucleotide analog by viral enzymes. Okay? Since the building blocks, oops, sorry about that. Since the building blocks would be nucleosides. The synthesis of the nucle nucleic acid can be blocked and thus stop viral replication if an improper nucleoside is incorporated into the growing nucle nucleic acid strand. The process is referred to as chain termination. Okay, now these drugs include gangliocyclovir, ribavir, zidovudidine, uh, didiansocene, and lemonibutidine, okay? So as you can see, they're all kind of modifications to the nucleus, nucleosides, okay? Now, acyclovir is used to limit herpes virus infections, such as herpes simplex virus. Ganglocyclovir is used to treat cyclomegalovirus infections. Rabavirvinir is used to treat respiratory syncytial virus infections in newborns, okay? Then I had also non-nucleoside polymerase inhibitors, and these are basically, they inhibit the activity of viral polymerases by binding to the site other than the nucleotide binding site. Uh, Foscarinet is used to treat uh, gangliocyclovir-resistant CMV, which is cyclomegalovirus, and a cyclovir-resistant HSV, which is herpes simplex virus. Now, non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors. This is where you're going to have reverse transcriptase, the enzyme, inhibited. So, remember that reverse transcriptase takes an RNA and converts it into a DNA strand. And basically what you have here is uh, these compounds will bind to a site other than the nucleotide binding site. 
nevipropine, adelavirine, and ifavirazes are uh, the three that are present. Drugs that prevent genome integration. Uh, these are uh, looking for an enzyme called integrase. You particularly see this with HIV in infections. Integrase basically is the enzyme that will allow the HIV um, nucleotide strand to be integrated into the host chromosome for a period of time, okay? So we use this to treat HIV infections, and the drugs are relatelegraphier and dolatelegraphier. Now, protease inhibitors are another big one. Now, protease inhibitors really allowed HIV patients, how can I say it, to have really the second life. Because when protease were, were added to the drug cocktail with the other uh, viral inhibitors, you really began to see people lasting much longer in their lifespan. Now, these are drugs that prevent the assembly and release of viral particles. A lot of times what happens is that you need a protease that's going to clip the different polyprotein sections into single peptide chains. Because what happens a lot of times is you're going to get a polysome. If you're not familiar with that term, basically what you'd have is the messenger RNA making continuously one protein, another protein, another protein. They're all attached together. An enzyme would then clip those into the respective separated proteins. But if you have a protease inhibitor, that will stop this process. And now you have this big, long chain and basically will be eventually chewed up by the body, but it would also inhibit any HIV replication uh, of the virus occurring. And sesquinavir, ritonavir, indinavir, melfinavir, each of these have differing dose requirements and differing side effects. Neuraminidase inhibitors, well, they inhibit neuraminidase, which if you remember is only seen with influenza. This is an enzyme that's essential for the release of influenza virions from infected cells. Therefore, if you block the systemic spread of the virus, you inhibit the continued progression of the influenza infection. And these include xenomimivir, which is administered by inhalation, and ostilomivir, which is administered orally. Okay? Now, that was a mouthful. Please, I'm sure you probably are having a couple of chuckles, but I do my best to pronounce it. The thing is to keep in mind that there are a bunch of different, really interesting ways to stop viral replication. Here's the caveat, though. They're going to be prescribed very cautiously because the drug companies, the, the physicians, etc., do not want these uh, strains of viral infections to develop resistance to these drugs. Okay? Now. What's the next biggie? We're going to be dealing with antifungal drugs. Keep in mind that there are some similarities to human cells with fungal cells because they are eukaryotic. They both have a nucleus, but they also have differences in some of the biochemistry that exists within the fungi cells and in their cell components, okay? There's not as many antifungal drugs. And the few that are available, some can be only administered systemically without toxic effects. A lot of the older drugs can only be applied topically. So this would be something that you put on the skin for, let's say, athlete's foot or diaper rash, but you definitely would not put it into somebody's uh, bloodstream or give it to them with the idea of inhaling it into their body. We'll get more into this. The most effective strategy has been found to act on the fungal cell component, ergosterol. Now, the drugs that act on the plasma membrane of fungal cells, polyenes, they're a group of antibiotics produced by streptomyces, and they bind to ergosterol. This disrupts the fungal membrane, causing the leakage of cytoplasmic contents and resulting in the cell death. Problem is due to toxicity. Most of them are used topically. Amphotericin B has severe side effects, but it's very effective in treating many systemic infections. So you have to watch the patient by giving them this particular drug. Nystatin is also top, uh, toxic systemically, but it is very, used very commonly topically. 
The azoles are a family of chemically synthesizing drugs, chemically synthesized drugs, the imidazoles and the triazoles. Triazoles happen to be less toxic. Both inhibit synthesis of ergosterol. Imidazoles, otherwise known as ketoconazole, is, can be used systemically, but it's more toxic. Myconazole and chlortrimazole are used to treat topical and vaginal infections and dermophyte infections. Triazoles like fluconazole and itronaconazole are used for systemic fungal infections. Some of these might be familiar if you've had experiences with, for example, athletes' feet or uh, some of the vaginal infections, etc. Drugs that interfere with cell wall synthesis. Now, there's a nice class called echinocandins, chinocandins, which interfere with the synthesis of the fungal cell wall component beta 1 3 glucan. They cause basically the fungal cell walls to burst, their fungal cells to burst, because with the cell wall component broken down, the cell walls will basically burst just like bacteria, which lose their cell wall. The first approved drug was caspofungin, and it's used to treat candida infections and invasive aspergillosis. Drugs that inhibit cell division, uh, grisofolivin, the mechanism is not really understood. It acts to interfere with tubulin during the cell division. It's concentrated in dead keratinized skin cells, and it's used to treat keratin skin, uh, cells in skin and nail infections. Okay, so you know when they talk about oh that ugly nail infection that someone got, well that may be the drug that they're going to be doing, because what it is is that it's in the living part of the nail bed, and that has to be delivered by a systemic approach. Does that make sense to everybody? Remember that keratin is the protein that makes up, of course, uh, you'll find it in the epidermis of the skin, but you'll also find it in nail, okay? Now, drugs that inhibit nucleic acid synthesis, ah, flucytosine. This is taken up by yeast cells and then it's converted to its active form, which is 5-fluorouracil, and that inhibits an enzyme required for nucleic acid synthesis. But the problem is it's not effective against molds, but it's effective against uh, systemic yeast-based infections. Um, it's got one problem that mutants for resistance can also occur. Here is our basic uh, figure 2017. You can see, keep in mind, interfering with cell division, plasma membrane synthesis and function, nucleic acid synthesis, and cell wall synthesis. These are the different targets that are set up. Now, from there, we got to deal with antiprotozoal and antihelminic uh, medications. Keep in mind now, this is going to get into some very interesting chemistry. And why I say that is because, guess what? Hey, folks, uh, there's a lot more in common with protozoans and helmets with us than there was with, let's say, bacteria or even fungi. Therefore, the mechanisms to disarm these parasites or these infections gets to be very, very tricky. Some of the uh, substances are poorly absorbed. Others have a certain range of effectiveness. And one other thing, resistance has been found to crop up. We'll get into that in a minute. Now, most of the drugs will focus on the biosynthetic pathways for protozoans and neuromuscular functions for helmets. Let's talk about antiprotozoal drugs first. When we talk about those that are intestinal, you have idoquinonol, which is poorly absorbed in humans. It's taken orally to eliminate amoebic cysts, such as in the intestine. Nitroimidazoles, specifically metrodiazinol, treat infections caused by anaerobic bacteria, but it's also treating organisms in anaerobic environments. So it interferes with the electron transfer and alters DNA. Okay, so this would be good in treating um, organisms by interfering with their basic uh, electron transfer, alter the DNA of protozoal organisms you got to keep in mind, though, that uh, it has a limitation. It doesn't reliably eliminate the cyst stage, and that means that the cysts we're going to be passing out of the body also, or they may stay there further. Quinacrine interferes with nucleic acid synthesis. Okay. Um, now, what about systemic 
protozoan infections. Now you're dealing with malaria and toxoplasmosis. Artemisin interferes with parasites' ability to detoxify the heme. And basically, for example, malaria. This is used in combination with other anti-malarial uh, medications. Uh, you may see this being used for artemisin-based combinational therapy. Um, basically, heme is a substance that accumulates as the parasite grows in the red blood cells. Okay, this is what we're talking about is basically malaria. Now, foliate antagonists such as pimethylamine and sulfonamide will interfere with the foliate me metabolism. Quinolones, such as chlor chloroquine, primaquine, and mefloloquine. Basically, chloroquine acts on infected red blood cells. Primaquine and tefenoquine destroy the liver stage of the malarial parasite. Mefloniquine treats quinacline-resistant strains of malaria parasite. If you're a big traveler into malaria-prevalent areas, you need to know this information uh, because basically, folks, they're showing up resistance uh, to quinacline, quinacline in many different areas. People will take quinacline when they go into malaria-bound areas as a prophylactic to prevent the infection, okay? But also, they're starting to show up with artemisin resistance as well as primaquine and mefloquine resistance in these parasites. Now, Anti-protozoal drugs that act on trypanosomes and leishmania. If fluorothene inhibits the enzyme ornithine decarboxylase, and then we have the heavy metal compounds. They basically will act on sulfhydryl groups of the parasitic enzymes. These include molarsopro, sodium, stibble gluconate, and megaloglum antimonite. Now, by the way, to help you, stibo means tin. Tin, yeah, it contains the metal tin. In the molecular compound. Antimonate is antimony. These are considered heavy metals. You wouldn't be having them in large quantities. You wouldn't want them in large quantities. It would have toxic effects. But some of these compounds have to be used to deal with these different types of infections. And nitrofermin ox is used to treat Chagas disease because it forms reactive hydrogen oxygen radicals, excuse me, and, and is basically toxic to both host and parasite. So you might be able to get away with a low dose or a fast dose, but then they have to watch the patient. Okay. Now, as we continue 25, uh, table 20.5, we got to deal also with anti-helmetic drugs. Now, again, we're taking two approaches here, intestinal and systemic. Oops, sorry about that. I apologize for the jumping around there. <sighs> Happens when you hit the keyboard the wrong way. <clears throat> Here we go. Now, benzamine diazidols. Okay. These bind to tubulin, block glucose uptake and microtubule assembly. Mebendazole, thiabendazole. Unfortunately, thiabendazole has many toxic side effects. Albendazole is used for the parasites echococcus and tenosolium. Uh, some of these are basically tapeworms, okay? Phenols, necloastaminamide, is absorbed by cestodes, not by the human host. Piperazine, such as piperazine, acts on the ascaris-induced infections and causes flaccid paralysis of the worms, so the person can basically expel them. Uh, diethyl carbamazine acts on filarial worms. Now, and also, yes, it's a mouthful, Pyrazin inosol quinolins, such as pyrazin quintol, causes tetanic contractions in the worms. This allows for the expulsion from the gut. Tetrahydropyranin, such as pyrotin palminate, interfere with neuromuscular activity of the worms. They get into paralysis, and it's used to treat pinworm, hookworm, and ascaris infections. Anti-helmetic drugs for systemic tissue infections. Now, again, this is where the worm is not in the gut, but maybe in the tissues, muscle, blood, etc. Avermectins, otherwise known as uh, the ivermectin, causes uh, neuromuscular paralysis, acts on tissue nematodes. 
By the way, ivermectin is also used um, as a preventative for, if you're a pet owner, heartworm. Okay. Uh, there's a, on the point of infection for heartworm, there's about a five week period. And so you give this drug ivermectin to your dog once a month, and it basically keeps them from getting heartworm. Okay. Tetrahydropyranins, otherwise known as oxinotel, uh, acts to treat trichoris, which is the trichinella infections. Trichinella is very common in uncooked pork. And so what happens is the individual consumes the uncooked pork. You can also get it in other types of uncooked meat. Um, hunters went out and they cooked, they uh, hunted and, and killed a bear and they came home with trichinosis. Um, the wild boars that run in this country, they are introduced species. Uh, one of the things that's common in those wild boars, the wild pigs, is trichinosis. And so it's either cook it really, really good or don't eat it at all because you're going to regret it. Okay, now let me go into the last part, which is new drugs. They're constantly in development. Many focus on unique differences between the pathogen cells and the human cells. Others are focusing on inhibiting gene expression. This is, for example, the antisense technology. And by doing that, inhibiting the gene expression of the pathogen kills the pathogen. Others act on an interesting fact that you're going to have what is called the symbiotic organisms of the pathogen. Case in point, Wolbachia bacteria. These are essential symbionts. They live together with the other organism, in this case, a filarial nematode. And the filarial nematode and the bacteria both benefit, and they can't live separately, actually. Now, this particular nematode is called Oxychera volvulvis, otherwise known as causing ocular onchocerakiasis. It causes the disease river blindness, otherwise known as ocular onchocerakiasis. The antibiotic treatment, doxycycline or tetracycline, will actually kill the Wolbachia bacteria and thereby cause the death of the filarial uh, organism so it kills off the filarial infection. Now, there's another class that was found. This is part of the innate immune system. Uh, these are defensins and meganins. Now, these are defensive peptides. They tend to work very differently from conventional antibiotics. Generally, they will block, instead of blocking a crucial portion uh, protein of the invading microbe, they're peptides that basically punch holes into the invader's membranes, cell membranes or dis disrupt their internal signaling. Some will actually appear to pump uh, up the host's own immune system activity, and then uh, basically the immune system will then overwhelm the invader. Uh, as a result, most of the peptides are effective against a broad range of germs, also because the peptides home in on basic physical properties, such as the overall charge on a, micro on a microbial membrane. The pathogens may be less likely to develop resistance. Now, here are some of the promising defensive proteins, also known as defensins. In the pupae of silkworm, Hydrophoria cephalocropia, there are two novel peptides called cecropium A and B, and they're made of basically a string of 35 to 39 amino acids. They've been found to kill E. coli and certain other gram-negative bacteria. There's been a peptide called drosocin, which has been identified in the fruit fly and it's used to attack fungi. Now, I remember reading this in 1984 in Science. There was an unusual protein found in frog skin. And this gentleman did all this research because he said, well, he was looking at wound healing. And when the leg of a frog was broken, how come they went back into the dirty water and they didn't get an infection? He found out there was a compound in their skin called meganins. Now, that's the word he gave it, and what it, what it is is a Hebrew word for shield, and an axon, are you ready? Bacteria, protozoans, and fungi. When stimulated by injury or microbes, the animals sweat out large amounts of these antibiotic peptides. And if you go to Genera, Genera Corp, it used to be under another name, but it's based out of the Philly area, they're presently trying to work on commercial development of this. Now, I'm not, you know, telling you to invest in it, see your broker, or see your... Uh, Investment counselor, yeah, 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 you know that whole routine. But there are promising hopes for new technologies coming. And by the way, the mechanism of action for defensins, they actually home in 
rupture the negatively charged membranes of the bacteria fungi, as well as non-enveloped and enveloped viruses. Now, of course, we're coming to the end. I encourage you to see the future opportunities at the end of the chapter, review the chapter summary. And we're going to go next into the wide world of lots of uh, organ system infections. Until then, have a great day.